In the quarter century that the Skagels lived in Bel Air, Ethel visited her brother and sister-in-law no more than three times, and she always arrived unannounced on their doorstep, acting gruff and tactless. Virginia Skakel recalled one such horrible visit. I was in my nightgown. My hair was in curlers. I had grease all over my face. And my kids were hanging on me like some poor white trash. So I finally opened the door and Ethel said sarcastically, Gee, kid, you look like Lana Turner, which didn't turn me on. I was terribly annoyed. Where's the coffee, Virginia? Ethel said. Why are you in this dark den? You can't breathe in here. Where's the coffee? She was so pushy and aggressive and I was so mad I was literally shaking. She just stared at me and she said, Well, gee, kid, tell me what you and Jimmy have been doing. I told her everything was fine, and she said, Well, Virginia, bring the children in here so I can see them. So these five snotty children wander into the room, and I said to one of the boys, Earl, this is your godmother. Ethel just kept asking about Jimmy and where he was, and I didn't tell her that when she knocked on the front door and he saw it was her, he ducked out the back door. He just didn't want to deal with her. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cher Denise. Um, we are going to keep going in the other Mrs. Kennedy today, but I wanted to say that I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving to those of you who are in the U.S. who celebrated Thanksgiving. I hope it was a really good time. Ours was fantastic. Today's episode is going to be just two chapters, and the first chapter is called Ethel the Omnipotent, which is kind of about how her personality made it so that she could just kind of sail through life. You know, she just never really took anything to be that serious. And so because she didn't take anything that seriously, nothing ever seemed to really hit her in any way. Uh, even things that would have upset other people or made other people introspective. Not Ethel. Hardly. She just, she knows how it's going to be. It's going to be that way. She's not going to get stopped. You know, she's just going to plow on. And then the next chapter we read is called Family Affair. And Family Affair is all about that Skagel drama, right? And it's about how her brothers, George and Jim, are wild. And their behavior is making Ethel push them away even more than she already had. And the family drama is getting to be so extreme that everybody in the family is like, what the heck is going on with George and Jim? As if we hadn't already been saying that. But now all the Skagels are like, what are we going to do with those two? Like, really, it's out of control. And as you recall from previous episodes, I mean, George's wife was burning down their guest house. I mean, it has gotten to be extreme with George. And then, of course, Jim has Jim's never been serious. You know, he's fooled around and played and acted crazy. And remember, he had been married to Virginia, the girl from Georgia, and then they got separated and now they're back together. But, you know, George is just I mean, he is a profound alcoholic and nothing's bringing him back from the brink. And so we've got more Virginia in the story and she doesn't know which way to turn. And then we've got Ethel treating Virginia terribly. And anyway, that's a great chapter. And I don't think we'll have any more time to go further than that today. It'd be nice if we did, but I, I don't want to anticipate that we do. So maybe at the end of those two chapters, I might find we have more time. But all I know is these two chapters are great. So enjoy yourself. First chapter is called Ethel the Omnipotent, like I said, and it begins. By 1963, the Kennedys seemed invincible. Following in the footsteps of his brother Jack, 30-year-old Ted had been elected to the U.S. Senate from Massachusetts, swept into office easily in November 1962 on a tide of pure golden Kennedy goodwill. Entering his second full year in office, Jack was enjoying his highest popularity ratings ever and political pundits were already forecasting something far greater for Bobby after the 64 presidential race, which many felt Jack already had in the bag. From the Kennedy camp came predictions that Bobby would snap up the governorship of Massachusetts, then the presidency, no later than 1972. Camelot, it appeared, was here for a long, long time. As for Ethel, she had risen to the occasion as the New Frontier's most favored lady, the very name Ethel had become as synonymous with the Kennedy mystique as Jackie's. It was as if there were two first ladies in town. Newsweek, McCall's, Life, Sunday magazine supplements, nationally syndicated columns. From one end of the country to the other, housewives, voters, were being given weekly, if not daily, doses of Ethel, her activities, her views, even her favorite recipes. Because the Kennedy administration had been promoting physical fitness, journalists began pointing to Petite and Peppy Ethel as the Kennedy woman more in tune with health than any of the others. Hearst's Journal American in New York advised readers to, quote, stay in trim with the New Frontier diet, 
which stressed that Ethel, quote, never counts calories. She claims that lots of exercise and a simple nutritious diet with lots of fruits and gallons of milk keep her healthy and trim. Marguerite Higgins noted that one clue to Ethel's health and exuberance was the lazy Susan in the middle of the dining room table at Hickory Hill that held bottles of vitamins for each of the Kennedys. Despite her claims of a healthy diet, Ethel admitted to Agnes Murphy, who wrote the At Home With column for the Sunday New York Post magazine, that she had a sweet tooth. I simply love desserts. My favorite? Chocolate roll filled with chocolate and vanilla ice cream with whipped cream on the outside, and yes, also with chocolate sauce. The Sunday supplement this week ran a feature under Ethel's byline about fitness and motherhood. Boasting that all her children were able to swim by the age of three, she said, I turned them over in their tummies in the bathtub and I told them to kick their feet. Noting that she and Bobby played games such as kick the can and chase one, chase all with the children, Ethel declared, There's just too much at stake in the world for us to deteriorate into weaklings, which will, in turn, affect our mental and moral strength. Ethel's exuberance had also manifested itself in the occasional use of government perks that sparked Bobby's enmity. Nothing seemed to irk Bobby more than to see official cars being used for personal errands. It was, he felt, bad public relations. He didn't want the voters to get the impression that the Kennedys were living high off the hog. Ignoring Bobby's feelings, Ethel continued to ride around town on the taxpayer's tab, but made it a point to do it behind her husband's back. Every winter, when it snowed in Washington, Ethel telephoned Justice Department's motor pool demanding that a car and driver be delivered to Hickory Hill post-haste. She'd pile a couple of children in the back seat with her, throw a sled or two in the trunk, and order the chauffeur to proceed to Hilly Battery Kimball Park in Washington, where she'd rendezvous with her pals and their children. Ethel would have the driver sit in the car at the base of the hill, and she and I and the children would have a grand time sledding down, one friend recalled. Then we'd get into the warm car with the kids and the sleds, and Ethel would ask the driver to take us back to the top. He'd then drive down to the bottom and wait for us. We did it over and over again through the afternoon. It was a riot. But then Ethel got hell for it from Bobby and Jack. (laughs) I should think so. What kind of abuse of somebody's time is this? That motor pool is not there for you. As, you know, my husband had a government car when we lived in Dallas, and he wouldn't take that car out for anything except to go to and from work. As he should. It's not his car. It's the government's car, and there was only one use for it. And, I mean, he wouldn't have thought for a second of letting, of, of ever using that car, not even to pick our kids up from school, would he have ever ridden that car for anything. And I just, I'm so surprised that she did this. I mean, she should have gotten hell from Bobby and Jack. That's ridiculous. Not only is it ridiculous that she's using the car, but that she's using this poor driver as basically their slave to take them up and down the hill. That's not what they're for. I mean, I think that her, if she had called for a chauffeur to come pick her up so she could go shopping... I think that would have been beyond the pale. But to tell him to come take us to the park and then take us up and down the hill so that we can go sledding with our kids? I mean, come on, Ethel. But see, that's that's how she was. She just sailed through life being like, whatever, fiddly dee, I'll think about that tomorrow. It was during these informal get-togethers with her girlfriends, outings with the children, shopping excursions, that Ethel showed herself to be as much of a Catholic crusader as her mother had been. When she saw a potential target for conversion, she zeroed in with missionary zeal. Susie Wilson, born a Jew and raised an Episcopalian, recalled Ethel espousing her belief that, quote, people who lived according to Ethel's faith would find reward in heaven. Following several trips abroad together, Ethel remarked to Wilson, Susie, you're the only person who has met two popes and hasn't converted yet. Sarah Davis also was exposed to Ethel's proselytizing, even to the point of being offered incentives if she agreed to convert a method that Big Ann had used in her heyday. See, that's wild to me. This is the thing. I I have no problem uh, with Ethel wanting her friends to be Catholic because she was Catholic. And if she truly believed that this was the way, that this was the truth, and that there was no denomination that effectively taught you about salvation, I would say she was a bad friend if she didn't tell her friends about the Catholic Church. If she thought she had the truth... And she did not say, I would love you to come to church with me. And she just kind of like left her friend hanging there. She thought her friend was going to go to hell if she didn't invite her friend into the Catholic church. Then she would have been in the wrong not to say something to her friend. She would have been in the wrong to be like, well, it might be awkward. I won't say anything. Right? So I'm fine with her wanting to tell her friends about the Catholic church. But this business of incentives, if you do it, now what is that? What is that? Is If, if they don't find you compelling enough by saying, if you 
you know, I want you to come to church with me because I want you to get into heaven. If that doesn't compel them, then you shouldn't give them some sort of earthly carrot, you know, to run after in order to get into heaven. They just, they're not interested. So just let it be. You don't need to like do God's work for him by like tricking people into like prizes. If, 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 if God can't do it in their hearts, if, if, if God can't move their hearts towards what you're saying, then, I mean, you've done all you can do. You don't need to be like, okay, well, they're not getting the message. So how about a prize? Ethel did her best to make me turn Catholic, Davis said years later. Ethel believed that if she got me to join the Catholic Church, she'd be assured a place in heaven. And that's why she really wanted me to do it. At one point, she gave me Imitation of Christ and Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain to read. But the major incentive was that if I agreed to convert, she'd pay for my kids to go to private school. At the time, we didn't have the money for private schools. But my husband then started to make money, and the kids who started in public schools all went to private school anyway. Ethel gave it a shot when the kids were really young, but never brought it up later. That is just so profoundly wrong to say, if you'll convert to Catholicism, I'll pay for your kids to go to private school. Ethel was more successful with Paul and Gertrude Corbin. A close and valuable political operative of Bobby's, Paul Corbin was at one point accused of being both a member of the American Communist Party and a rabid supporter of Joe McCarthy's. He was disliked by others in the Kennedy camp for his arrogance. Arthur Sussinger Jr., for one, called Corbin a, quote, natural-born con man. Gertrude Corbin, though much older, had become close to Ethel, volunteering her time at Hickory Hill for whatever Ethel needed done, opening correspondence, working on charity functions. The Corbins idolized the Kennedys. Their Virginia home was a shrine to Ethel and Bobby, the walls covered with photos and other Kennedy memorabilia. That is weird. When Ethel began proselytizing, the Corbins listened attentively. Ethel was responsible for us converting and becoming Catholics, acknowledged former Presbyterian Gertrude Corbin years later. Ethel and Bobby were there at the conversion. Ethel felt very proud. Ethel became my Catholic godmother. If I wanted, I could go to her with my personal problems. I always felt that Ethel would have made a great nun. I don't know. Maybe. Religion aside, Ethel was still the capital's best-known party giver and funster. But her bashes had become a bit more subdued. The pool dunkings had ended, mainly because the publicity had infuriated the president. Later, Ethel admitted that the pool shenanigans were, quote, awfully unfortunate. I don't like that subject at all. They probably hurt Bobby. But the parties at Hickory Hill continued on a weekly basis. In early 1963, Ethel threw one for General Maxwell Taylor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that had all the capital buzzing. Arriving guests were greeted by a dummy dressed in a U.S. Army general's uniform hanging from a tree by a parachute harness. Taylor's place at the table was marked by the traditional champagne-filled large bowl used by a paratrooper to celebrate his first jump. Joan Kennedy, who'd recently been quoted by a national magazine as saying that Jackie owned three wigs, wigs were fairly new as fashion accessories in those days, sat down to find her place marked by three miniature hair pieces. And CIA Chief John McCone found a black box at his dinner place that suddenly exploded open, revealing a green hand that reached out and closed the lid. At another party, they made Vice President Johnson, whom the Kennedys barely tolerated, red with anger and embarrassment. After the party got rolling pretty good, recalled Jim Skakel, Ethel got up on a chair, and she was feeling pretty good, and she said, I'm giving a toast to the second most important man in the Western world. Rushton Skakel, who was also at the party, said that before Lyndon Johnson could move toward the microphone, Bobby rushed up to claim number two spot. LBJ was so shocked he couldn't believe it. His temperature either went up or down. While Johnson may have taken a dim view of Ethel's sense of humor, most everyone, it seemed, fell for her hijinks, even intellectuals like Rose Styron, a poet and the wife of writer William Styron. Ethel and Rose, the mother of four, had first met at the birth of Camelot, and usually saw one another during the summers when the Styrons held forth at Martha's Vineyard and the Kennedys vacationed across the water at Hyannisport. Ethel was someone who was always game to have a good time, Rose Styron said later. We'd go to the beach, and everybody would sleep on our lawn, and there were a lot of hijinks and a lot of fun, and Ethel was always a part of it. My view of her was so two-dimensional, so much as a sportin' and an athlete. One summer day, the Kennedys, the Styrons, and other friends decided to go to a private beach on the other side of the island. Knowing it was a long, rocky road down to the sand, Ethel commandeered a van from one of the Styrons' neighbors, loaded it with kids, food, and beach gear, and followed by Teddy, Eunice, and others in a car, headed out for the day. The first mishap occurred upon arrival when Ethel raced onto the beach. The van got stuck in the sand and had to be dug out. 
After that, everything went swimmingly, with lots of fun and games for the kids and the adults. At the end of the day, with the plans for everyone to have dinner back at the Sirens, Teddy took it upon himself to round up the crew. We better get back, he yelled. Get dinner started. Ethel said, I'm coming too, I'll get everything. Recalled Styron, Ethel really was the great organizer of all this, and she collected everybody. We all got back to the house and put dinner on, but suddenly we noticed that someone was missing. Well, where's Eunice? Teddy asked. And nobody could find Eunice. About an hour later, after it had gotten dark, Teddy came out to me in the kitchen and said, Rose, you won't believe what's on the front porch. And there was poor Eunice, drenched because it had started to rain, wrapped in a tiny little towel and nothing more, looking so distressed no one could believe it. Eunice had been behind a dune sunbathing in the nude, and Ethel had picked up everything on the beach, including Eunice's bathing suit and shoes, and thrown them in the van with everyone else's stuff. Eunice had to walk barefoot back up the rocky path and all the way out to the main road. She had to hitchhike twice. She got one ride after another until she got home. Can you even imagine? Discovering everyone had left, you've got nothing on except for this tiny little towel that you've been sunbathing on. You've got to walk across the beach stark naked, then get up on the road and try to get a ride home hitchhiking, and that you had to do that not once, but twice. And imagine, who, what sort of person is going to stop for you stark naked on the road? Also, what kind of a person doesn't get you where you need to go when you don't have any clothes on? What's wrong with that person's soul? Anyway, the Kennedys all thought it was the funniest thing that had ever happened. Poor Eunice was torn between weeping and fury. Out riding one afternoon in 1963 near Hickory Hill with a couple of her children, Ethel came upon an upsetting sight, an emaciated horse locked and tied to a chicken coop. Horrified, she galloped home at once and ordered her groom, Richard Mayberry, to bring the animal back to Hickory Hill so that it could be cared for. The horse's owner, Nicola Zemo, a trainer with a record of animal cruelty charges, was furious when he learned of her mission. He demanded that the animal be returned instantly. Ethel refused, reporting Zemo to the County Animal Welfare League instead. When the horse died of malnutrition and a severe anemic condition a week later at Hickory Hill, the League brought another cruelty complaint against Zemo. Thus began a bizarre, almost comical legal battle between Ethel and Zemo that would involve two trials and stretch out over almost four years. Zemo was handed a suspended $250 fine and a six-month suspended jail term, and then sued Ethel for $30,000, the cost of the horse. Overnight, Ethel, who was eventually exonerated, became the unofficial patron saint of the nation's nags. Behind the scenes, though, Ethel found the whole scenario a big hoot, according to her chum Sue Markham. We knew this was going to get Ethel into trouble, but somehow we couldn't stop laughing to keep from crying, Sue said later. Here was this horse, looking like a bag of bones in a comic strip, standing there, or trying to, with all the fat, sleek Kennedy horses with their initialed blankets on them, and Ethel had stolen it, and, well, it was just so funny that there was no way you could stop laughing even when we were being serious, like Charlie Chaplin movies when you laugh because somebody's falling off the Empire State Building. At one point, during the height of the publicity surrounding the case, Ted Kennedy was introduced at a National Press Club luncheon, not as a senator from Massachusetts, but rather, quote, as the brother-in-law of an admitted horse thief. Quick on the uptake, Kennedy said, it must be hereditary. I understand Ethel's grandfather really was a horse thief. Well, Ethel and Ted found the case a big joke. Jack was livid. Columnist Joseph Alsop's wife, Mary Susan Mary Alsop, recalled being seated next to the president at a White House dinner when the subject of Ethel and the horse came up. I'd had a little too much to drink, because you always do at the White House. You're so nervous, and you gulp down everything that's passed to you, she said. I told the president this story about his sister-in-law, and instead of laughing, he was furious. I told him he was being stuffy. Imagine saying such a thing to the president of the United States. But he talked to the person on the other side of me for a while, and then a little later he turned back to me. You know why we disagree, he said, about whether this story is funny or not. It's because you like Ethel as a friend, and of course you want to protect her, but you're not responsible for what happens. I happen to love her, and also be responsible, because I'm the president and she's my sister-in-law. I felt so badly afterwards, because, of course, I thought he was worried about the publicity, but not at all. He was worried about Ethel. He knew she had a propensity to do things impulsively. When the horse rustling case was finally concluded, Ethel quipped, I don't think Bobby's going to let me off the property again without my keeper. And that was certainly the wish of some of Ethel's neighbors in McLean, who were furious about her habit of riding roughshod over the property, much like she had done as a girl in Greenwich. 
One neighbor, Hope Johnston, who had grown up in Greenwich and knew the Skakels well, lived midway between Hickory Hill and the home of Ethel and Bobby's good friends, Red and Anita Fay. To get to the Fay's place, Ethel would just ride right through my lawn and leave big hoof prints behind, Hope Johnston said later. She'd do it periodically with a whole troop of kids on horses. You could hear them coming, clop, 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 and then they'd cut across the lawn. Of course, the horses left their stuff all over the place, too. She just didn't give a damn. One neighbor used to go after her with a broom. What she did was typical Skakel, typical Kennedy. She had no respect, and it would make my husband hit the ceiling. But Hope dared not complain to either Ethel or Red Fay. Hope's husband was then a Navy captain at the Pentagon, and Fay was an undersecretary of the Navy. Fay had once boasted to Johnson that he was, quote, the only person in the Defense Department who McNamara couldn't fire because he was such an old friend of Jack's. There was no way Johnston, who would later become an admiral, was going to go up against that kind of clout. One night, the Johnstons were having dinner when they heard the screams of fire engines racing up the street and stopped at Hickory Hill Stables. Thinking the place was ablaze, they ran outside and found the firemen laughing hysterically. It was the first frost of the season, recalled Hope Johnston, still chuckling years later. The horse manure had been piled up outside, and the manure is hot, and when you put it in cold air, it smokes. One of Ethel's maids saw all the steam coming out of the horse manure, and she thought the stable was on fire, so she called the firemen. What a crazy place that Hickory Hill was. Indeed. But I tell you what else is crazy. Ethel's family. This next chapter is called Family Affair, which is just more of that strange Skagel drama. And it's interesting because everybody always says of them, oh, it was typical Kennedy, typical Skagel. Um... Like, that's just how they were known. They were just known as people who had no breaks. And this chapter definitely highlights that. So it begins by saying, Ethel's euphoria over the boundless political successes of the Kennedys was once again threatened by her own family's peccadilloes and the threat their exposure posed to her in-laws. The latest bit of unhappy news that Ethel received from Greenwich was the breakup, after almost 10 years, of her sister Anne's marriage to John McCooey. To Ethel, divorce was sinful and utterly scandalous. Moreover, she knew it infuriated her mother-in-law, the devout Rose Kennedy. The McCoys' union had been rocky from the start. Immediately after their marriage, they had moved into one of the guest houses at Lake Avenue, living under Big Anne's controlling thumb. Her parents' death a year after the marriage left Anne traumatized. In 1958, after trying unsuccessfully for several years to conceive, she finally gave birth to a son, John Jr. But by 1960, her marriage was about to veer off track. That spring, at a dinner party held at the Greenwich Home of Friends, Anne met William M. Fine, a charismatic New York businessman whose high-profile jobs had included being publisher of Harper's Bazaar. Like Anne, Fine was married. He and his attractive wife Patricia and three sons lived in Darien, an affluent community much like Greenwich. Like the McCooys, the Fine's marriage was on the rocks. Bill and Anne were drawn magnetically to each other that night, called Bev Keith, a close friend of both couples. I remember being very surprised because Anne really wasn't Bill's type. He liked more glamorous women. But Bev Keith wasn't entirely shocked. In those days, we called Greenwich Grimwich because the people there didn't seem to have a handle on real life, she observed. There were lots of parties, drinking, and fooling around. It was a very hypocritical place. Once our friend Bob Mathias, the Olympic star, a big good-looking guy, came to visit, and women went bonkers over him, practically handing him their panties. While friends of Anne's weren't shocked by her affair, they were surprised at how open it was. It was almost as if Anne didn't care who knew, a pal recalled later. She told me about the beautiful letters Bill wrote to her and the attention he was giving her. And then Anne got pregnant. She was in Florida with a friend from Greenwich, Sally O'Brien, when she got the news. Sally's husband, Royal O'Brien, the baby's godfather, said it was well known that the baby was Fine's. Anne acknowledged it from the beginning, he said. John McCooey was stunned. I knew the baby wasn't mine, he said later. I knew the affair was going on. One day before the birth of the child, Anne came to me and she said, I want a divorce in favor of Bill Fine. I said, does Bill Fine know? And she said, of course he does. I had somebody call Fine to check to see if he knew that Anne intended to marry him. Fine then called up Anne, got her on the phone for an hour and just slaughtered her. He told her, are you crazy? I have no intention of marrying you. Anne had the baby, a girl whom she named after herself and her mother at Doctors Hospital in Manhattan. She then returned to the McCoo's home on Winding Lane in Greenwich, where she lived for six months before permanently separating from her husband and renting a townhouse on Manhattan's Upper East Side. The Skakels were aghast. Ethel, for one, stopped talking to her sister for more than a year. Worried that Anne's problem might become public, a Hearst gossip columnist had the story and was threatening to print it, Ethel asked Bobby to meet with John McCooey to work out a quiet divorce settlement. 
A meeting eventually took place in Kennedy's suite at the Carlisle Hotel. Bobby was changing to go out, and he was in and out of the bathroom taking a bath, McCoy recalled. He definitely could have lived without that meeting. He was attorney general, and he had plenty on his plate without me. But he'd promised Ethel to talk to me. He was interjecting himself for Ethel's sake. In his own inimitable way, he tried to persuade me to give Anne a divorce. Let's have no more mess, he told me. He wanted to have it peaceful. I said, there's no mess. There will be no mess. I told him Anne could have a divorce any time she wanted. All she has to do is give me custody of our son. Bobby asked me to think about what he had said to give it some serious thought. We couldn't reach a conclusion and I left after about an hour. Anne had made a number of financial demands on Makui, which she eventually dropped. When Makui saw that it would be all impossible for him to get custody of his son, he dropped that demand. Several years after their separation, Anne went to Mexico and got a divorce on the grounds of incompatibility. Later, the Makui's marriage was formally annulled by the Catholic Church. Anne subsequently married her divorced lawyer, Peter Ryan, but that marriage also ended in divorce after almost a decade. After his second wife died, John McCooey married Helen Downey, a New York real estate woman, one-time actress, and longtime friend of the Skakel family. At the same time that Anne's marriage was disintegrating, Ethel learned that her brother George had left his wife Pat and was having an affair with Baton Alois. She was a beautiful Swedish stockbroker with the investment firm of Bear Stearns in New York. While Ethel loved George, she had come to realize that he was a loose cannon who couldn't be trusted, especially with the family business, which he was running when he wasn't playing. Luckily, he had competent executives who steered him away from questionable deals, such as one to develop a chain of resorts catering to 60s swingers, a far cry from his father's lucrative love affair with coal dust. Baton was a guest at one of those legendary wild parties thrown by George and Pat Skakel when he met her. He was concentrating on Swedes in those days, recalled Bill Whiteford, a longtime friend. George's relationship with Benton was unusual in that she was single. Most of his affairs had been with the wives of his wealthy friends. George was totally amoral, said Whiteford years later. I never could figure out how all those guys handled it. There were a lot of husbands who were afraid to come out and say anything against George because he could be very intimidating. But some of them were good sports about it. One husband even allowed George to sleep with his beautiful wife on the deck of a yacht while the husband slept alone in the master cabin. I don't know if I'd call that being a good sport or just being completely without a backbone. Some sort of sad sack Casper Milktoes who hands his wife over to the arms of another man. You allow it to happen because you're being a good sport? No, you're being a lousy human being. Are you even a man? What is the matter with you? How would you even allow this to happen? On your yacht, some other man has found himself with your wife on the deck, no less, and you're just going to go take a nap? Man, you deserve to lose your wife if that's the way you feel about it. George didn't make a move on Benton until long after the party in Greenwich, when Whiteford, Benton, George, and his girlfriend of the moment spent a wild weekend together in the back seat of a taxi in Bermuda because all the hotels were full, it being rugby week. They lived in the back seat of a taxi? All four of them? For a weekend? What the actual hell? Back in New York, George began dating Benton, who quickly fell head over heels for him. George was charming, sweet, spontaneous, she recalled fondly, but he drove me through heaven and hell the whole time we were together. Over the next two years, with George dangling the promise of marriage, Benton enthusiastically participated in George's bacchanalia. George lived and played on a grand scale, thanks to the fortune his father had amassed. With the business in good hands, he'd take his friends on trips to far-flung spots on a moment's notice aboard the Great Lakes Carbon Plains. For one weekend of fun, they'd fly off to Hong Kong. Several times he flew a crowd to Belgium just for Thursday night parties. George's gang went hunting for wild horses in Utah, trapped wildcats in Colorado, and participated in orgies of eating and drinking. On a good day, George consumed as much as two bottles of vodka, though he never seemed drunk, and was not considered an alcoholic in a family of them. And of course, there was plenty of sex. Yet George, indoctrinated well by began, was still a fervent Catholic who interrupted his revelry to go to communion, confession, and mass. I would go with him rather reluctantly, said Benton later. It was so hypocritical. I cannot even conceive of why you would ever step into the confessional if you had no, no desire to change your lifestyle. I feel like I would be so ashamed week after week to come back with not One, but multiple stories of the same kinds of egregious behavior I'd come with the week before. I'm not Catholic, but I just feel like just the idea of going to confession 
would keep me from a lot of foolish mistakes because I wouldn't want to have to say out loud I'd done any of those things. And so I'm just shocked that not only did he keep doing these things, there was never seemingly a curb in it. And he would just go and confess and then do it again. I mean, I guess if you feel like, oh, all I have to do is just go confess and I say a couple of things and I say some Hail Marys and, you know, then it's all forgiven. Maybe you feel like there really isn't any reason for you to change your ways. But if that's really how you're living, do you even believe? Do you really believe that the God of the universe sent his son to die for you? Because if you believe that, your life would change. Your whole life would be a prayer of thanksgiving to him. Not to say that you would never make mistakes, you're a human being, so of course you're going to. But you would at least be striving towards better. It just feels like this was like his fire insurance. Like, well, I don't want to go to hell, so, you know, I'll just make sure I do whatever I want. But then as long as I just go confess and take the sacrament and everything like that, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm sorry to say it, George. I don't know if you are. His religious beliefs notwithstanding, George's wildness was nonstop. At the Hotel Plaza Athene in Paris where friends maintained a sumptuous apartment. George drove through the lobby and up the grand stairway on a motor scooter wearing only his underwear. As a result of that evening's excesses, the friends were evicted after 15 years in residence. Friends and family members saw George as crazy and self-destructive, a man who got perverse pleasure out of putting himself into dangerous situations, risking death and sustaining serious injuries. In a Paris restaurant, he slipped and fell from a tower of chairs and tables that he'd built to demonstrate what it was like climbing aboard an elephant. He broke his leg and suffered a limp for the rest of his life. In Utah, George had gotten permission to hunt for wild horses on an Indian reservation. The hunts were another excuse for George and his pals to go wild. All of his girlfriends would show up, and George would jump from tent to tent where the women slept. During one of the post-hunt dinners, George and a 300-pound oot named Boone, began tossing a knife back and forth between them. George added to the danger by being the first to put a flip on the knife, which Boone managed to catch by the handle. He then flipped it back at George, who feared that the blade would wind up in his hand if he caught it, so he let it go. The knife sliced into the calf of George's leg like a knife into butter, recalled Bill Whitford. It cut right to the bone, huge piece of meat just hanging there. Mal Stevens, a former football coach and a prominent Park Avenue physician, who was a guest on the hunt, said, All right, George, let's go into my tent, get sewed up. According to friends, Stevens had gone on a number of George's trips and had sewn up lots of casualties. One afternoon in Aspen, George and his gang piled into and on top of his car and recklessly drove along the sidewalk to the top of the Horn restaurant for lunch. Just as George was preparing to order, a young policeman who had witnessed George's driving and was livid stormed over to the table. You know, pal, the officer said, What you did is unconscionable. You could have killed someone. I'm taking you in. Well, I'm not going, George said firmly, looking back at the menu. And don't go for your gun either, because I'd put it down your throat. Somebody better be ready to die, because I'm taking you with me. Bill Whiteford, who was present, said, I was sure George had had it. But by God, the cops actually left. George turned back to the rest of us at the table and burst into his maniacal laughter. He loved it. He just loved it. But Benton saw a softer, more sensitive side of George Skakel Jr., whom she felt was a, quote, very unhappy and lonely man. After seeing Days of Wine and Roses, the Jack Lemon Lee Remick exploration of alcoholism, Benton said, George just absolutely hated it. He felt the story was too close to home, and he wasn't only referring to the situation with his wife, Pat. I'd never seen him look so sad. Of his six siblings, Jim was George's favorite, Benton said, but he loved Ethel a lot. They didn't see much of each other, and he rarely talked about her. He certainly avoided going to Washington because he didn't like Bobby, and he often wondered how in the world Ethel could have married him. During the two years of their affair, George kept showing Benton divorce papers that he said he intended to file. Then he promised that they'd be married and move into a beautiful new home in Palos Verdes. But George was lying through his teeth. He had revealed to Bill Whiteford, quite gleefully, that the divorce papers he was waving in front of Benton's eyes were bogus. You know, Willie he confided to his chum. You gotta do these things sometimes. I don't want to marry every girl I go to bed with. Finally, Benton had had it with George's empty promises. She gave up her job, her friends, her apartment. She and George had never moved in together because he actually felt it was immoral to live with a woman out of wedlock. What? But she returned to Europe for a year to visit her family, to ski, and hopefully to forget about him. I had two incredible years with him, she said years later. It was hard to live under those circumstances because he was not really free to get married, but I don't regret any of it. 
Well, I'm glad that she doesn't regret it, but I would. I would regret wasting two years on a man who would lie to me and show me fake divorce papers just to keep me around for a good time. Maybe if both of them thought that that was a, a fun time, maybe that's why she doesn't regret it. Maybe that was right up her alley. It must have been. She stuck around for two years. But it seems like a nightmare. It just seems awful to be with somebody who was so lost and so grasping, so flippant about what is good and true and right, and then would wander into church and take communion and say confession and then just like hit the street once more to just be wild with women and drink and parties and just nothing, nothing to hold on to in a life like that. Anyway, what of Jim, Ethel's other brother? The book says, meanwhile, Ethel and her brother Jim had completely stopped speaking. Jim's wife, Virginia, said that brother and sister had grown apart after Ethel got so politically opinionated following her marriage into the Kennedy family. When he wasn't off on some wild exploit such as harpooning whales, Jim worked on and off for a Great Lakes carbon, collecting a sizable check and other perks. At Virginia's urging, however, he agreed to move to California, in part so they could distance themselves from the rest of the Skakels. Jim had been drinking heavily, and his health was poor. Virginia felt that they could find a better quality of life on the other side of the country, far from Greenwich and Washington. They moved into a pretty home near the exclusive Bel Air Country Club, where Jim spent his days on the links and his nights at the bar. At home, Virginia had become a virtual recluse, spending most of her days in a bathrobe with all of the shades down. This is just so depressing. In the quarter century that the Skakels lived in Bel Air, Ethel visited her brother and sister-in-law no more than three times, and she always arrived unannounced on their doorstep, acting gruff and tactless. Virginia Skakel recalled one such horrible visit. I was in my nightgown. My hair was in curlers. I had grease all over my face. My kids were hanging on me like some poor white trash. I didn't dress every day. I just didn't want to go out. My hair was a mess. I was a chain smoker and I had cartons of cigarettes lying around. The house was filled with cigarette smoke because the windows weren't open. I actually lived in the den of the house and that was the only room I could invite her into. So I finally opened the door and Ethel said sarcastically, Gee, kid, you look like Lana Turner, which didn't turn me on. I was terribly annoyed. Where's the coffee, Virginia? Ethel said. Why are you in this dark den? You can't breathe in here. Where's the coffee? She was so pushy and aggressive and I was so mad I was literally shaking. She just stared at me and she said, I just wanted to see you and Jimmy. Well, gee, kid, tell me what you and Jimmy have been doing. I told her everything was fine and she said, Well, Virginia, bring the children in here so I can see them. So these five snotty children wander into the room and I said to one of the boys, Earl, this is your godmother. Ethel just kept asking about Jimmy and where he was, and I didn't tell her that when she knocked on the front door and he saw it was her, he ducked out the back door. He just didn't want to deal with her. One evening, Ethel bumped into Jim and Virginia at the bar at the Bel Air Hotel. Ethel was seated with some of her friends at a table, and Jim was in his usual spot at the corner of the bar, drinking alone while Virginia sat with some friends. Ethel asked Virginia to tell Jim that she was there and that she'd like to see him. Now went over to Jim. Virginia's cake were called. And I said, there's Ethel. Aren't you going to say hello? And he said no. And that was it. Over the ensuing years, the relationship between Ethel and her brothers and sisters was to deteriorate even further. Well, that's where I must stop, my dear friends. But uh, we will have some more episodes next week. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I will see you guys later. Bye.